Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, this presentation uh, on effective citizen advocacy is brought to you by the Peace Education Center. I'm the Terry Link, the co-chair of that, along with my colleague Becky Dean, which is there's Becky. Um, also, the Greater Lansing United Nations Association, the MSU Peace and Justice um, Studies Program, um, Edgewood United. Uh, Justice and Peace Team, oh yeah, the Julian Samora Institute here at MSU. So thank all of them for helping make this possible. We actually had uh, Jim on the calendar to be here last April, but events got away from uh, us on both ends of that, partly because of what goes on in Washington. So we're glad that we were able to finally get him here this year. The work that he's doing and the work that we're about is uh, ongoing work, so it's not it's never out of date, unfortunately. Um, this is also brought to you by the, uh, uh, the local Lansing Friends Committee on National Legislation Advocacy Team. I'm a member of that. Uh, we utilize the, the Quaker, and you're going to learn about this tonight from Jim, who's been doing this for a long time. Uh, the Quaker approach to, to, to making effective uh, change uh, is something that we've been involved in. We've had a team here now for a little over two years. We were the first local team in Michigan. There's now five teams in Michigan. Jim can bring you up to date on how many teams are now effectively working uh, across the United States, but every month we have these uh, combined conference calls and there's more and more teams and more and more players, partly because the approach works and there's many people like you in the room who want to see a difference being made. Uh, that team, by the way, I'm very happy to announce, has scored a face-to-face -face visit with Senator Peters this week. And uh, so we're, uh, th these are hard to come by, as you might think, uh, and we've been working at it for a couple of years. So uh, it's a pleasure and difficult to uh, introduce Jim Payson, the, use the title, the Associate Executive Secretary for Strategic Advocacy, Legislative Director for Foreign Policy of the Friends Committee for National Legislation. Difficult to introduce him because I've known him uh, for, I think, more than 40 years now. <laughs> And we came together with my wife, Christine, out of the anti-apartheid movement, where uh, uh, Jim really was a very, very important uh, person in the staff of the American Committee on Africa, Africa Fund in New York, whose uh, leaflets and programs and films and the like were absolutely key to Michigan State University becoming, using its ethical statements of, of principles, which aren't always so uh, evident in our university, to become the first university to completely divest the top holdings and corporations uh, operating in South Africa, and who also then encouraged the Michigan legislature to pass more bills of sanctions on South Africa apartheid government than any other state in the nation. So Jim was key to the, all those efforts and so many more <coughs> countless hours of work. I also have a pleasure not just to introduce Jim, but the Friends Committee for National Legislation this is a, uh, an organization I hope you'll affiliate with and get, become familiar with their website and consider joining us in the FCNL chapter here because I don't know of any other organization of either faith communities or secular that stays on target and stays on strategic foci on legislation that those of us concerned with justice and peace need to attend to in Washington. That's what led uh, our churches, uh, Edgewood United Church, to decide to give uh, more than $1,000 every year to this organization because we feel that it is so strategic, so effective, and does such a good lot, uh, job of mobilizing us out in the community. So any of you from other faith communities, I would urge you to consider that as well because uh, this staff is, I, in my own judgment, having looked at the Presbyterian Methodist and United Church uh, uh, political arms in uh, and Washington is far more effective than them, and it's key to coordinating their efforts to focus on the big issues, one of which now they're leading us in, and this local SCNL chapter is to lobby on the Korean issue, and that will be at the front of our agenda when we meet with Senator Peters on this coming Friday, uh, which Terry has, has set up, and in order to avoid both nuclear war and any kind of other bloody nose action with land troops and and bombs that people might uh, might consider. FCNL also is backing the Eliwiesel Genocide and Atrocities Prevention Act, 
a bipartisan bill that is key to as a cog in uh, the peace action uh, in Washington. And FCNL together put together uh, support of 42 senators to support the Iran uh, nuclear deal, which were in danger of getting back on uh, Trump's agenda with this great liberal uh, that has just been appointed as his national security <laughs> advisor, who has said he at one time had never seen a war that he didn't like. And also, those of us in the in the UN community are very concerned. He's also said, we, um, when asked by President Bush, who appointed him as our representative of the UN, was said uh, how he liked his job at the UN. He said, it's wonderful. It's a target-rich environment, meaning for him to attack. And he suggested even that we could take off the top 10 stories of the uh, UN building, which includes the peacekeeping arms and other coordination, and we'd be all be better off for it. Um, I could go on for an hour and take up all of Jim's time talking about the wonderful uh, war is not the answer. Um, uh, the uh, Under Bush, getting the Bush administration to withdraw the building of the robust nuclear earth penetrator bomb that had been proposed in those days. Um, and to focus on so many issues that we're all concerned with on uh, U.S. wars and militarism, getting at the Trump uh, budget on criminal justice, economic justice, environment, uh, immigrants, Israel, <coughs> Palestine, very active now, Native American issues regularly, bringing in Native American representatives to be trained in advocacy on, on their issues, civil liberties, budget priorities in the Pentagon, voting in elections, and U.S. wars and militarism. So it's been a tremendously effective uh, work. And they've had this wonderful coordinator for it, and, and Jim Kaysen, who um, is in, really in charge of directing all of the strategic work on especially international issues, but the lobbying campaigns of the FCML. So he's a, a walking encyclopedia of the issues, of what's being done on them, and what's the state of play. Uh, he's had a wonderful career, including eight years as a correspondent in Washington for La Jornada, Mexico's second largest daily circulation newspaper, um, as well as working with the Africa Fund, the American Committee on Africa, and even uh, being a uh, leader in the formation of the, um, um, excuse me, of the Africa Funds, uh, unlock the apartheid prisons campaign and more. With all of that, he's a graduate uh, of Erlen College right here in the, in the Midwest, where he and others will uh, be starting a program uh, this spring to celebrate the 75th anniversary of this organization, the FCML at Erlen. And they've got a wonderful program going there, uh, so they would like to invite you to, to come to that. But without um, further ado, let me welcome Jim Kaysen, our hero and our uh, wonderful leader in strategic international foci in Washington. I want to start by saying thank you. Thank you, not for coming tonight, although thank you for that as well, but also thank you for the work that you're already doing here in Lansing and East Lansing. I think it's really what gives us hope. People ask me all the time, how do you work in Washington, D.C.? I mean, it's just, you know, I, I don't know. I put my phone away, so I don't know if something happened in the last 10 minutes that came out on Twitter. But I, uh, that it, there are a lot of things that go back and forth. And, what gives me hope is the work that you all are doing in other parts of the country, and particularly the work you're doing here, the work I see in places like Wichita, Kansas, St. Pete, Florida, and other places I visit, where regular people are building relationships with their elected officials. And it might be the UN Association, it might be a student group on campus, it might be Indivisible. There are lots of ways in which different people, people of faith, people uh, from college campuses, business people, are all trying to figure out how do we work to influence what our government does. And of course, I think the election of Donald Trump got more people involved. And so you saw uh, openings for more engagement. And, but as, as we start, I would just say maybe a little bit about myself that you didn't hear in Dave's introduction, um, and then a little bit about FCNL, and then we'll go into what is the FCNL model that you've been hearing about. 
And thank you, Terry, for being persistent in getting us to get together and have this date to talk about these issues. I hope we can keep sending FCNL people up here to keep the conversation going, because Michigan is really important for the agenda that Quakers have asked us to pursue in Washington. So in addition to what you heard from Dave, I am the son of missionaries. I grew up partly in West Africa, in a country called Liberia. Uh, lived around the world before ending up at Earlham College. And really, it was at that point I was looking at what is the role of my government, but also what are the roles of US corporations in US foreign policy. There was a coup in a country called Chile back then, when I was in college, so it was a few years ago. And, uh, we were very concerned about the role of U.S. multinationals there. And then uh, the situation in South Africa, was I was in college right at the moment of the Soweto uprising. And so that formed a lot of my early education. And that education moved forward to a very wonderful time working with Dave uh, and Chris and lots of other people as we worked to influence and U.S. policy towards South Africa and to support people in South Africa trying to change their own government. And I'll tell you one story from that experience because it's a story that has really influenced, I think, what I've done from then on out in my, maybe it goes like this, in, in my life. And that is, we had a moment, Ronald Reagan was president, it was the middle of the 1980s, and we had a moment when we were pushing for sanctions against South Africa, so U.S. sanctions. And uh, you had a congressman from this area, Mr. Wolfie, who was in instrumental in that effort. Uh, ultimately, Congress passed sanctions. It went to the president. The president vetoed those sanctions. And many of you probably already know this history. And Congress overrode that veto, which is, I can tell you as a lobbyist, that's a heavy lift. It doesn't happen very often. And I had an opportunity. And the overthrow of that legislation in the Senate was led in part by Dick Lugar, then a senator from Indiana. And I had an opportunity to talk to, I think it was his chief of staff, about six months after that. And I said, well, why did Dick Lugar decide to vote against his own president and over overturn this veto of these sanctions? And he said to me, Jim, it wasn't because a bunch of you were getting arrested in Washington. He said it was because when he went back to a basketball game, and that's what they do in Indiana, they play basketball. And when he went back to a basketball game in Richmond, Indiana, they asked him about apartheid in South Africa. And that's what made him realize that this is something he had to do something about. And for me, that was an educational moment. That was a moment when I really, a moment in my life when I realized that's the power we have. And so here I am as a registered lobbyist in Washington saying to you, I don't have as much power as you do in, in this equation. And that's why I think it is so important, this work you're doing, however you're doing. I, I feel like FCNL is an important part of that movement to change policy. We have. Uh, I, I, I often say, and I'll see if, if I can get this right, there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is we have 20 registered lobbyists, which is a lot for a small faith organization. So the bad news is that's the largest group that has registered for lobbyists in Washington, for pe registered lobbyists for peace in Washington. So that's what we're up against. I, what we see our role is, is to get information about what's happening in Washington and to get that information out to you all so that you can work with your senators and your representatives to try and move federal policy in a different direction. And for me, what I appreciate about what FCNL does, and as Dave said, FCNL's been around for 75 years, and I'm not that old. Uh, the, the process that Quakers have established for this organization is one that I find the best process that I've found anywhere. And that, that's because as an individual, I get to start with what I believe. I'm not going to you, sir, and saying, hey, 
this is something I think would be good for you. I'm going to you first and saying, you know, I'm a nonviolent activist. I don't believe war is ever a good idea. My faith leads me to, to believe this. I'm not looking for you to be me, but I'm interested in having a conversation with you about what is sound public policy in areas that we might be able to work together. And so we're actually not, as FCNL, trying to make Congress Quaker. We're, we're <laughs> probably a good idea. Uh, the, what we're trying to do as FCNL is to bring Quaker values into the public policy discussion and then have a conversation about what's the next practical step that we can move federal policy to take that will move that policy in the direction of the world we seek. And so, why is it a good job for me? It's a good job because I get to live my values. I don't have to pretend I'm something I'm not. I'm not trying to convince Terry to be who I am, but I am opening up space for a conversation with Terry about where we might agree. And so at that 75th uh, anniversary celebration in Richmond, Indiana, we're going to have Senator Todd Young. And he's going to be one of the speakers there, a Republican senator from Indiana. People said to me, well, you guys don't agree with Todd Young. And I said, well, why do you have him there? He said, well, because that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're not trying to say anybody in the Senate, probably nobody in this room agrees with me on everything. But there, there are things that we can work on to make our country's policies better. And in Todd Young's case, she supports that peace building bill that Dave mentioned earlier. And we've worked with him some on trying to reduce and ultimately end the Saudi military campaign in Yemen that has created one of the worst famines and the really a resurgence of cholera and other things in that part of the world that Senator Young has really been a leader on that. He's really done a lot of good things. And so we're looking to work with him on those issues. There are plenty of issues over here that we're not going to work with him on. And he knows that, and we know that. So it's, a, it's an honest, straightforward relationship from our point of view. So as we get going, I am interested in who we are in the room. So I'm hoping I can just ask you to raise your hand so I can get a sense of how many of you have ever sent an email or a letter lobbying your members of Congress? Okay, so most people here. How many of you have ever met your member of Congress? Okay, so how, how many of you are members of FCNL's advocacy team here? Okay, and how many of you know anything or have ever heard a speaker from the Friends Committee on National Legislation? Oh my goodness, okay, I'll have to be careful. <laughs> the, uh, Things change over time. Oh, uh, okay, good. See, uh, I, th I think the, the, the things I would say about FCNL just briefly, if some of you have heard this before, is we think of ourselves as prophetic and that we have a vision of the world we would like to see, a world free of war and the threat of war, and, and there's a whole piece of what's the world we'd like to see as in, in a big picture. We're practical in that we're looking to figure out, as I said earlier, what's the next step that people around the country can take to move members of Congress in the direction of the world we see. And here's the one that you don't often hear from Quakers that I think is also important is, this is powerful. And that's, I think, why Terry wanted us to have this conversation, so we could test that thesis, that there, we have found that there is power in engaging with congressional offices on these kinds of, on, on many of the issues that we work on, that you can actually support members of Congress. And I, I'd be careful here and say, I'm not normally going into somebody in a congressional office and getting them to flip 180 degrees. Oh yeah, I disagreed with this and now I agree with this. It's much more often the case that you have a congressional office that hasn't taken a position, or where the staff is wary of doing something because of the political consequences. And that is the case on a, on a lot of different issues. And that's where you can make a difference. You can really have an impact on what those 
what that office can can do. And I want to I want to make an a, a assertion and see whether or not you can either prove me wrong or prove me right on this. Many of you probably remember when President Obama came into office that he one of the first things he did is he hired a lawyer named Craig Gregg and he said we're going to close the prison at Guantanamo. We're going to we're going to close that down. We're going to empty that prison. This is a mistake. This was the wrong approach. All of these terrible things happened there. And what happened? He reduced the number of prisoners there. I think it's down to 41 now. But he didn't close it. And what I'm hoping is that if we do our work, if you do your work with whatever groups you're working on, when the next president comes into office in 2021, and they want to close Guantanamo, there will be the political support for senators and congressmen so that the prison will be closed. So that's one of the things that I think, from my point of view, I'm trying to work with people around the country to build. That, in a way, pre we had a president who wanted to close that prison, and he couldn't. And there were problems in the Pentagon and other places too, but the big obstacle was the Congress kept passing legislation saying, we're not going to let you close this. We're not going to let you move these uh, prisoners back to the United States. And so that's part of the change long term that I would like to see. And, you know, we're not a Friends Committee on National Legislation. We're not a one issue organization, as you heard from Dave. And that's not the only issue we work on. But that's, to me, that's an illustration of what I think is possible if we use this political moment to get more people engaged, to get more people supported. Because when you talk to people around the country, when you get past the fear, talk about torture, you talk about the terrible things happening there, strong majorities in this country think that this is not what America should be doing in the world. So for me, that's part of the long-term goal. The shorter-term goal and the shorter-term work that we have been successful at doing in this period of time is we've been blocking things. So we blocked the repeal of the Affordable Care Act. And let me just say a little bit more about that, because I think it's a good illustration of this kind of work. We spent a lot of time in a few states trying to figure out what was needed in order to help senators not vote for that. And if you remember, in addition to the Democrats, John McCain, Susan Collins, and Lisa Murkowski voted against that bill. Now, McCain, we didn't have a lot to do with, but Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski, we spent months and months working with particularly faith community people in Washington, but also in Alaska, to bring people into her office. We had long conversations with her. She expressed concern about people whose health care costs were going up. She, we had back and forth. We published letters to the editor two days before the vote in the Senate. I flew a poor guy not a poor guy, but a dedicated Quaker from Alaska took a 13-hour trip for a 45-minute meeting in her office that we brought faith leaders in. And we had a, a, probably a 45-minute meeting with the senator herself. I'm not saying we convinced her to do this, but her staff said that helped. And it helped not just because we had that one meeting, but it helped because they knew, she knew, and her staff knew that there were people, there were Catholics, there were Lutherans, there were Episcopalians, there were college professors, there were all of these people who didn't support some of her environmental pieces, but would support her in this vote and would speak up and speak out in support of her and say, she did something good, that senator did something good long term. And that's that's the work that makes a difference, so that she could be one of the no votes. And that's the work that we've done on a number of other issues, working with partners like the UN Association. If you look at what Congress has done on funding for international engagement, the president, several, two years in a row, the president has come and said, we want to cut this about 30%. Both years, Congress has come back and said, no, we're not going to cut it by 30%. We're actually going to keep it not where we would like it to be, but a lot better than what President Trump had proposed. And for us at FCNL in particular, in addition to supporting UN funding and supporting 
peacekeeping funding and supporting a bunch of other of the big accounts, we really focused on some of the accounts that allow the U.S. government to be responsive to crises five years from now, not just the wars five weeks from now. And we've been very engaged in defending some accounts, including accounts that the Trump administration in their first 100 days tried to zero out specifically. And so we see the efforts of people around the country as making that kind of impact on what your government can do and what your government won't do. And again, it's often supporting senators from both parties who are trying to do this kind of work and letting them see that they have support to make this a priority. And I, I think that the, you know, Terry asked me to say a little bit more about, so what is this Quaker model? I don't know that it's really a Quaker model. Like we would see it as a, as a model informed by Quaker faith and practice in that, again, it starts from values. I think the other thing I've encountered around the country is it also starts with listening. And if you'll bear with me for a second, listening is a lot harder than most people imagine. And I know this whole audience, you guys probably all are really good listeners. Uh, for me, it's hard. It's like I go into a room and I think, what's my goal here? What am I trying to accomplish? What am I going to get Terry to do? And going into a room where you've got your own values, but you're really trying to understand deeply where Terry or where that senator is coming from, when there's someone you really think you don't have much in common with, that's pretty hard. But we think that's pretty important. And that doesn't mean I'm a pushover or I'm not supporting FCML's values, but it, it is a part of understanding where that other person is coming from. Because likely as not, for me as a lobbyist with a faith community, that person I'm sitting across the table from comes from a faith perspective as well. And they're trying to figure out what they think is the best thing to do. So those are the first two pieces of it. And then it is persistence. It really is not just saying, OK, I went, I lobbied. They didn't do what I want. Now I'm done with this. It's taking, you know, how many years have you been working on getting a meeting with Peters? A little over two. A little over two. So taking the time that, you know, we, we tell a story of a, a Republican representative in Utah who, uh, there was another one of these advocacy teams formed in Salt Lake, and they, uh, they went and they said, we really want to work on a, an issue that is important for FCNL as well, which is the authorization for war. So right after 9-11, our government passed pretty much a blank check that allows three different presidents have used to fight wars all over the world and against a whole range of different enemies. And they were going in, they wanted to talk to her about this, and uh, her staff said, no, she doesn't care about it. Domestic issues are her issues. Those are not her issues. She's not going to lead on that. And they kept coming back and said, no, it hasn't changed. And they went to a town hall and they asked her, and she said, oh, I'm kind of interested in that. But then they still couldn't get a meeting. It took a year and a half. But a year and a half later, they saw her in an airport, and they went up to her. They didn't say, why didn't you return my phone call? They said, you know, we still want to have that conversation. And she said, OK, here's my cell phone. Text me, and let's find a time. She ended up introducing a Republican version of a bill that Barbara Lee had introduced to repeal the authorization for the use of military force. It didn't pass, but for us still, that's progress. That's moving the conversation. But it takes a long time. And if you're going to, if you don't have the persistence for that, then you're not going to build that relationship and you're not going to do that work. And for FCNL, at least in our community, we're looking to that 2021 vote to try and let the president close Gitmo. We're not just looking for the vote for tomorrow or the next day. And I think that's the other piece I would make. We have built up this network that Terry talked about to the point we have 96 teams around the country, advocacy teams, that are meeting with members of Congress or their staff on a regular basis, trying to build relationships <coughs> with these offices and 
trying to figure out who in their community should be involved in this conversation with the lawmakers. Who do the lawmakers need to hear from if they're going to work on, if they're going to move on a particular issue? And we've worked on the authorization for the use of military force. We've worked on sentencing reform. Last year, we worked on Pentagon spending. And this year, as Terry said, we had a, we have a huge concern about the escalating crisis on the Korean Peninsula. And so all of these teams, and there are new teams being built pretty much every month, are engaged on that issue and trying to bring that issue into congressional offices. And that's part of a broader effort by the Friends Committee to figure out lots of different ways that we can support people around the country to get into congressional offices. And we, we do that through advocacy teams. We have a large uh, young adult movement now. We had 450 young adults uh, in Washington at the end of March lobbying on immigration issues, particularly trying to defend DACA students and prevent more investments in det detention beds, more investments in a wall, and all of these other things that have been proposed. And while we certainly didn't get what we wanted, we did end up in the omnibus actually getting a lower number of detention beds and preventing a bad agreement that would have traded permanent status for DACA students for a wall and more detention facilities. And so for us, that was progress in this environment. So, and we're doing that all over the country with several different <coughs> programs, all of which are designed to get more people into congressional offices, and particularly to get more people, as Terry and the team here have done, to build that relationship so they actually know you. I love it when Margaret uh, says that she knows the person when she goes into the congressional office uh, here locally. That's tremendous. Uh, the positive story is that members of Congress often feel trapped by the politics as well. And I'm not saying poor them, we should just have sympathy for them all the time, but I do think a lot of times they don't see a path to do something different. And if you can provide them, if we can provide them with the support on small things, sometimes we can get movement on some of the bigger things. And so the concern that every member of Congress has about sending troops into war still doesn't prevent them from often being willing to shovel even more money into the Pentagon while not putting the proper amount of investment into diplomacy and development and international cooperation. But when we get together with senators and representatives, we can get bipartisan groups of senators, for instance, to say, yes, the US government should invest in forward-looking prevention of atrocities and violence in other countries. And we've helped to set up an atrocities prevention board within the US government that is an interagency group that meets on a regular basis and looks to the future to try and figure out what is it that we could act on now with a little investment that might prevent something terrible from happening five years from now? And that effort started in the Obama administration, is still going on in the Trump administration, and we've got legislation that would make it permanent that is sponsored by both of your senators, and I think it is about 40 other senators around the country. So it, it's moving forward again, slowly but importantly, I think. And I, I guess maybe the thing is just to come back to, to, people ask me all the time, well, why is it worth it? Why do these small steps? Why not just don't participate in the political system and try to build your local community or just do the protest work? And I believe in protest. You heard earlier, I got arrested, I've gotten arrested many times. I think this is important because we don't want to be absent from that political conversation. We don't, we don't want to not be there when those conversations are happening. And because we have seen, as Dave made a reference, we've seen where with a little bit of effort, we can actually block proposals to build new nuclear weapons. And there are new ones coming around the corner right now. We've seen with a modest amount of effort that even though one of the most powerful lobbies in this country lobbying against the diplomatic 
agreement with Iran, that Congress did not uh, torpedo that agreement. And again, that issue is coming up again now because we have a president and a national security advisor who seem to think that blocking Iran from building nuclear weapons is not a diplomatic thing that we should be working on. Uh, so is it, is it difficult? Does it, do you do something and then nothing changes? No. But if you keep doing it, you keep working with members of Congress, I've found that some of the people who were the least persuaded in support of the Iran deal back in 2015 are now people who, I don't, who say, no, no, Jim, I get it. That diplomacy is really important. We can't not do that. And so you build up that kind of credibility with those offices, and that's what makes a difference. And what we're hoping is that if we keep building up that credibility, we can both block some of the worst proposals that are coming forward, and we can continue to make progress on some of the funding issues. Uh, the, there are areas where we got more money this year in the budget than we did last year. Not the Pentagon, but in other parts of the budget that we didn't expect. And for you all, although it was advertised as international relations, I imagine everybody in this room knows that Senator Stabenow is going to be right at the middle of one of the biggest debates this year around food stamps and the reauthorization of the Farm Bill. And she's going to be under a lot of pressure from our own party, from other people, to make compromises. And compromises that mean people have to choose what meals they eat at the end of the month are, in our mind, not good compromises. And so I'm really glad to be here, and I'm looking forward to having a bit more of a conversation.